everyone. Welcome to our second edition of Lift Each Other Up. We are so excited to have you here today, have you listen in. We are going to focus our conversation today on boost your self-love and foster healthy relationships. Absolutely perfect to talk about during the month of February. So before we get started and we introduce our, our wonderful special guest, we just want to remind you what Lift Each Other Up is. So we did talk about this last time we met in January uh, when we were here with Dr. Nicole Barnes. However, we just want to remind you that we are here to make the play, this world, right, K-12, Stride, but just the world, generally speaking, a, a kinder, more loving, more accepting place. And so really just want to remind us what our theme is and that it, that is going to be that we are dedicated to continuing to advocate for mental health, mental health awareness uh, in students. And this really did come to fruition based on a really successful bullying prevention series that we had back in October. Uh, I can't believe it's almost March. I actually said in January, I can't believe it's almost February. And now here we are, February, it's almost March. Um, but really this did prompt us through Rich's vision to come up with Lift Each Other Up, our webinar series on mental health and mental health awareness. So again, just as a reminder to everyone here, you are going to have the ability to type uh, to your heart's content in the chat box. We do not have the mic open. However, you can definitely communicate through chat. So again, we're so excited to have you here. We're excited that you're here. And just remember, this is a safe place. This is a safe platform where we can talk about mental health and personal challenges, as well as hopefully giving you the ability to connect with us um, our special guests that are here, and then of course with each other. So our goal definitely is to connect others. It, it's essential as far as your overall wellness. And please just know that we are here to support you and we are very thankful that you are here. All right, we are excited. We have our special guest with us. We have Dr. Hughes here. And so Dr. Hughes, I would love for you just to take a moment to say hello to everyone before we get into our conversation with you and just let everyone know where you are, uh, where you're from and you know what, uh, what you specialize in. Hi everybody, I'm very excited to be with you. Uh, my name is Dr. Tammy Hughes. I am a school psychologist I'm a licensed psychologist, and I'm also board certified in school psychology. I'm coming to you from Pittsburgh, uh, where I've been for over 20 years, but originally I am from Texas. And so you might hear a y'all come out every once in a while. <laughs> I, can, I can fall back into that. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Y'all, that's a that's a really fun thing. Um, and, and I'm in South Carolina today. So love hearing that. And uh, please, you're always welcome to, to be completely expressive in who you are. Um, so we are excited because today you are going to talk to us about what makes a healthy relationship. And so we would really love to start that conversation here. And then for everyone who is here, Please go ahead and put any questions that you have along the way in chat, any feedback, anytime that we see something, I will definitely share it out with Dr. Hughes. So I'm going to start off with talking about healthy relationships uh, because it is February and we just uh, had Valentine's Day, which always brings forward um, our thoughts around relationships and uh, those that we love and those that we want to um, know more about. So what I thought we would start off by saying is, what is a healthy relationship? Let's define that from the start, and then we can talk about what's not a healthy relationship and then how to get there. Um, usually what kids and parents talk to me about is, what am I supposed to do to, to get to a healthy relationship, not just um, know what they are? But just to make sure we'll do some level setting, uh, make sure we're all on the same page. When we talk about healthy relationships, we're talking about three things. And so you can see those up there um, in the red. This means that the relationship is positive and positive means uh, that you feel respected, that you can have honest communication, but it's reciprocal. And this is really important because it means that it's fair and equal and mutually beneficial 
So we think about the, the push and pull of relationships. There's not an imbalance. One person is higher than the other, but rather it's reciprocal, even though we can give and take at different times. And it's interdependent. And what interdependent means is that there's time for both shared interests, what you all love to do together, and individual interests. So we're gonna spend a, a good bit amount of time talking about making sure that you have both shared and individual interests. So if you were to ask me, if you met me on the street and said, what is a healthy relationship? I would say, you're gonna to have to understand yourself so that you can understand well other people. And really the beginning, the foundation is about understanding yourself. So thank um, you, Dr. Wanna, um, oh, go ahead. Oh, sorry. Oh, no, 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 you were right. Go right ahead. All right, thank you so much. So we do want to talk about domestic violence statistics. So I'm going to go ahead and start this conversation. But again, since we have Dr. Hughes here, I would really like for her to, to talk um, about this in, in more detail. She is the expert here, um, but just everyone kind of sit in with the statistics that we have here. So on average, nearly 20 people per minute, per minute are physically abused by an intimate partner in the United States. So we have been in this recording now uh, for almost seven minutes. So if we think about that, nearly 20 people and we do the math, multiply that out by seven, that's how many people uh, have been abused in the United States. Um, during one year, this does equate to more than 10 million women and men. And what's really important to preface here is that we're not just saying women, we are saying anyone, right? Anyone at all, it, it is not indicative of just, you know, one, uh, one demographic. Also, one in three women and one in four men have experienced some form of physical violence by an intimate partner. And this does include a range of behaviors. So again, this could be uh, slapping, it could be shoving, it could be pushing, uh, it could just be any type of, of violence. Some cases may not be considered actual domestic violence. Um, however, there is still that abuse, that physical abuse. It could be physical abuse. It could be mental, emotional abuse as well. 19.3 um, million women and 5.1 million men in the United States have been stalked in their lifetime. So again, uh, what will be very important is maybe Dr. Hughes, you can shed a little bit of light between the difference um, when we talk about physical abuse emotional abuse, mental abuse, and then of course, when we do tie in stalking, which we do know can lead to reported violence. And almost 61% of female stalking victims and about 44% of men reported being stalked by a current or former intimate partner. So either that person who, who they're currently with in a relationship or even someone that they were with at one point is coming back to, to stalk them in some way. And then on a typical day, there are more than 20,000 phone calls placed to domestic violence hotlines nationwide. 20,000 phone calls that are placed for help, for support, for advice, um, for, for anything that can, be done as far as even resources for them, 20,000 calls a day. Um, and then intimate partner violence accounts for 15% of what we would be considering violent crime. Uh, and then of course, domestic victimization is correlated with a higher rate of depression and suicidal behavior. So the more that someone is in a domestic violent situation with a partner or with an ex-partner with someone current in their life these people do tend to have higher anxiety higher depression um, higher mental illness and even potential suicidal behaviors or ideologies so dr hughes would you please give us 
information from your perspective on the severity of this, the importance of, of knowing the, some of these statistics, as well as the differences between that physical, mental, and emotional abuse? So the reason we started off with the idea of what is a healthy relationship and defining that is just to get on our radar, where are we trying to get to? What are we trying to uh, accomplish in our relationships? Relation relationships are the foundation of how we work together, how we make families, and how we um, go about our daily lives, successful daily lives. And what we're looking at here as we look at the domestic violence um, statistics is looking at where things go wrong and the impact that has on people's lives. So there's not only the abuse in the relationship, but that also impacts the kids in the family, it impacts employers, it impacts friends and other uh, people that love you and love people in these relationships. So what is not highlighted in these uh, data is the surrounding uh, community that's worried about um, negative relationships. And so it's with these two ideas in mind, what is a healthy relationship and what do things look like when things go wrong is really what we're trying to bridge the gap and um, allow the audience to ask questions about what do they need to understand. These data show us clearly that um, not only are crimes occurring, but also uh, mental health outcomes. Um, and I would also say physical health outcomes and then wherever you live and work. So whether you're in school or whether you are uh, in a job, this is the, the negative outcome that uh, occurs when our relationships are problematic. Thank you for that, Dr. Hughes, because that is important. And you know, we, we would like, again, to encourage you to put comments in chat, anything that you have on your mind, anything that you would like to chat about, talk about, uh, get support or advice from. Just again, remember that you are in a safe environment where we are here to support each other. And as it says, we are here to lift each other up. So um, what this slide is about is really sort of unpacking how we come to have uh, good relationships. And it also highlights, if you think of each of these little boxes, where things can go wrong. And so one of the things um, when I'm talking to kids and I'm talking to families, um, they tend to be very focused on um, other people in particular. How do I make them like me? How do I understand them so that we can have a relationship um, you know, that I desire or what have you. And so there's really this balance between the self, who you are, and who the other person is. And a lot of our kind of popular culture focuses on you looking at others. But what I'd like us to do is focus on the self first, because that's really the key ingredient to how we come to um, appreciate and come to um, be interested or attracted to different kinds of relationships. So having a, a very um, foundational understanding of your sense of self is the most critical piece. And I would say, particularly for kids, what they should spend their time thinking about. Also parents supporting kids, of course. So I'm gonna talk about two different areas here. There's self-awareness and what motivates me. And so when I talk about self-awareness, what I'm thinking is, do I understand my feelings as they occur in real time? Am I aware of my feelings? Can I identify them? Am I able to label them? Of course, can I express them appropriately? But when something's happening in real time, what am I feeling? And then related to feelings is the source of the feeling. What is it that's causing that feeling or is driving that feeling? So part of my self-awareness is how, my, how I'm feeling. That is really influential to how do feelings then move into thoughts. So this is about what motivates me and how do feelings move into actions or behavior. So building my own sense of self, how do I think and feel and what motivates me is the first and essential ingredients to positive uh, relationships.
once I understand what, how I think and feel and what motivates me, now I can start to understand or think about what motivates other people. How do they think and feel? So if I just went through these uh, little lists here, I would say building a sense of other people is how do they think and feel? What motivates them? How do they work? And once you can understand yourself and understand other people, then what you can do is use that information to work together cooperatively. And I'll bring us back to our slide a few minutes ago so that you can have positive reciprocal and interdependent relationships. So my first um, highlight that I'd like folks to think about is really being able to focus on yourself and figuring out what motivates you. Therefore, we're setting yourself up for positive relationships. If we went back to the domestic violence slide and talked about uh, being in uh, different types of relationships that are problematic, often there is a overvaluing of what the other person thinks and feels and an undervaluing of what I think and feel and what's motivating for me. A focus on how do I make this work rather than how um, am I um, feeling in this, uh, in this relationship? And so you have a list over here, slapping, shoving, pushing, all of those kinds of behaviors that are uh, happening in the relationship. And oftentimes we see folks um, not leaving these relationships as quickly as they might is because they have that focus over there and trying to figure out how to fix that so that it doesn't um, so that it doesn't happen again. For the case of stalking, and which we call obsessional following when it when it's kids, um, for that case, what we have is a, an attachment that's only about what we do together, and not about that interdependent piece. What do we do alone? And so when you're alone, that. I wish I was with them. I can't live without them. I need to know what they're doing all of the time. I want everything happening together. Doesn't allow for that shared and independent. And the only way to have that independent interest is that sense of self. Tell me if I went too far and that was just too much information there. No, not too much information. Perfect, and you're getting a lot of loves and, and hearts in there for sharing that. So we're gonna go, yep, I was gonna say, we're gonna go back to you. Um, I put a bunch of resources on here, um, both for parents and for kids. Um, these are just, there's some QR codes for people to link to um, reputable uh, resources. But the idea of, um, for parents and for kids to know is that the way you think about relationships, whether it's friendships, whether it's dating, whether it's intimacy, that the way that we think about them changes as kids age. And what we expect of ourself and what we expect of others changes as we age across the lifespan. So if I'm a young kid, I might be thinking about things like, am I a good friend? Am I reliable? Um, do I like being with this person? I might think about them. What are the things we can do together? Um, how do we move from one type of relationship where we're uh, just in, engaging in activities that are similar to a, re, uh, a relationship that includes more of a dating sort of a situation? And what these uh, resources do is sort of takes you through those different developmental questions. Um, and there's also some, uh, some uh, recommendations for parents, uh, particularly with teens, when they may not be so interested in talking to you like, like they used to. <laughs> Thank you for these resources, Dr. Hughes. I think this is really important for everyone to look at here and you know you can hover your phone over and capture the codes and save these as resources for you whether now that you look through them or after this uh, over the weekend you know whenever it is conducive for you to have time to look through these resources 
because it's really important as you progress through your life, depending on your age here. And we know that we have some parents here. We have some learning coaches. We call them learning coaches at K-12. So we have some learning coaches here. We also have students here and students of varying ages. So these are going to be perfect for you as far as the resources, because it may be that you are in a, you know, a, a, like a, a budding, blooming relationship and, you know, you're a little bit younger. Who knows? Maybe you're 15, 16, of course, because, you know, we're not going to date until we're 80 years old, right? Um, but in all honesty, dating does seem to start a little bit earlier than it did back when, when I was much younger. Uh, my daughters are 18 and 20 now, and I remember, you know, them coming to me and saying, hey, you know, I want to start dating at such a young age and, you know, I'm, I'm going to be 54 this year. So, I, <laughs> I mean, it was a totally different time when, when I was much younger and these resources would have been so helpful for me, you know, looking, looking through and, and how to determine what was healthy and, and, you know, what, what boundaries that, you know, I needed to set. So I really do hope that you all look through these resources and please feel free to share them with friends and family or, and especially if you know someone who is in a situation, I'm gonna go back here just for a moment. If you know someone, a family member, a friend, um, you know, anyone, a, a neighbor, anyone at all that is in a situation like this, you know, having the resources available, having the phone numbers available as to where to call, who to call, how to offer support, in a healthy way that doesn't put you yourself in jeopardy or at risk, but gives that other person who may be going through a situation that would be considered domestic violence or just general violence overall stalking, you know, that that is inclusive of this too, would be very helpful. Because again, if we do the math, as sobering as this is, we should do the math. We've been in here for 22 minutes now. So if we think about 22 minutes, every minute, every minute 20 people are physically abused. So if we do that math there, you can even put it in the chat box and make that determination as to even during the progression of us here, you know, the, the severity of how many people would be in a physically abusive relationship um, with either a current or past partner is, uh, you know, it, it's pretty, it's pretty frightening. So thank you for these resources, Dr. Hughes. And let's go ahead now. We really want to turn this over to questions and answers that you may have at this time where Dr. Hughes can be supportive of you and answer anything that is on your mind or you would like to chat about. And it does look like we do have one question right now, and that is, why don't people just relieve, leave abusive relationships? Why don't they just get out when they're in them? Um, so for a couple of reasons that we talked about uh, for this on the slide before, one can be an overvaluing of um, the other person's perspective rather than your perspective. Um, you know, we talk a lot about gaslighting which is really somebody tricking you into what's happening. And then you start thinking, oh, maybe I don't understand what's happening or maybe I'm the crazy person. Um, so that's one uh, major reason. Um, another reason that comes up, um, unfortunately, is when you come from a family where domestic violence or interpersonal violence is present, you can have an anticipation that sometimes people who love you might also hit you. Sometimes people who love you might also exploit you. And so it might not be altogether evident to you from the start that this is completely uh, inappropriate. And um, so those are two sort of relationship reasons that they happen that that happens. Then of course, there's other situations where people don't have enough money or people don't have um, the know-how, uh, how, to, how to get help and, and those sorts of things. But really when we see the literature uh, tells us that it takes 
seven to eight times for people to leave for them to actually stay away. It's really this uh, interpersonal dynamic that happens where you don't trust your own uh, your own judgment, um, and that gets that makes you feel um, unsteady and not sure what to do uh, next. Thank you, Dr. Hughes. Mm -hmm. What about if someone does not really like who they are and feels that they deserve to be in a relationship like that? How do you work with that person? How, what can that person do to receive some help and support to get them out of the situation that they are in? So if, uh, let me make sure I understand the question. What if somebody doesn't like who they are? Um, that, I think is an excellent question because if you aren't satisfied with who you are, if you have some uh, things that you would like to change about yourself, um, that can be fine. People actually want to change things about themselves all of the time. Um, so that can be fine to set goals and have people to support you. Um, and also sometimes people, kids in particular, are too hard on themselves meaning there's some sort of ideal that you think you must be, or you feel like um, there's judgment from other people. And um, again, that relying on outside versus inside. So some of, sometimes when we think about um, helping kids, we're thinking about saying, you know, I'm fine just how I am. And um, we could move that from body shaming all the way up, up to um, uh, gender expression or what have you. And so there's a balance between what is um, a realistic and healthy goal and not valuing uh, who you are and why might that be and how can we reframe that? Um, because people are lovely just the way they are and not, not everybody has to be the same. Absolutely, we have two more questions and possibly some more. Um, so what if we have someone who is the abuser and they are looking to seek help and they are looking to to stop their their destruction their violence toward others but perhaps this is something that they grew up with and so this is the world as they know what advice do you have for that person or the the family members who may be listening into this for that person who may be the abuser well that's uh that's a a great question because Oftentimes, even people who grow up in homes where abuse is occurring, they'll say to themselves, I'm not going to be like this. And then they will find themselves uh, acting in very similar ways that they may not even want to, but rather that's been their experience and that's how they have learned to cope with problems. And so the, the short story is, is that we need to understand that people usually come to being abusers by having been abused themselves. And so that means two different kinds of, of support. One is to change new beha old behaviors to new behaviors. But the second is to say, this uh, happened to you and this is understandable why this might be happening. However, it's not just because we can explain it doesn't mean it's an excuse. Um, you still need to change your behaviors to be able to be in a positive reciprocal relationship. Um, what I think is the hardest cases is when people don't want to change who they are, right? If people want to come and say, I need to change because this, I didn't want to turn into my, you know, my uncle was like this and I didn't want to be like this. Um, that's the easy scenario. The hard scenario is when people are like, I like, I like being like this. And that's a, a, a different approach of how people usually seek support, sometimes by court order or something like that. Absolutely. Now, thank you, Dr. Hughes. We, we have another additional two questions. So does abuse tend to get worse when you're in a domestic violent relationship? Um, yes and no. Um, as people age, they become more diverse in their skill set, right? You get older and you know how to try to get my way uh, in a more complex way. Just like if you were dealing with a little kid who wanted something and they, 
it's kind of easy to see what they what they want and you can thwart them. Um, but as they get older, if they haven't learned different skills, then they get more diverse. And um, so th there's that piece of it. Um, and of course, um, a lot of other variables, including increased stress impacts how uh, uh, negative and how impactful the abuse can be. So there's both the number of ways um, that abuse can change and also the intensity uh, of abuse. And then of course, if you add anything like drugs or alcohol or um, even just regular stress, let's add COVID um, to uh, our propensities, um, that's gonna make things uh, worse. The more stressed you are, the worse things uh, tend to be in terms of intensity. Thank you for that. Uh, we have two more questions again. We have, what if I disapprove of my kid's relationship? So from a, a, a parent or learning coach or guardian's perspective. Yes. So this is actually something that comes up uh, quite often, usually with teens, uh, sometimes older adults, uh, where kids are like in their 20s or what have you. Um, but uh, certainly this comes up with uh, peer relationships as well. So the short story is families matter very, very much when kids are little. And then as you move into middle school and high school, peers matter more, peer pressure, right? Um, and sometimes uh, parents or adults find themselves in a situation where they don't like the choices their kid is making. Um, and so they want to quash that uh, quickly. <laughs> And um, that's actually not the most useful way to interact with kids. Um, what I always talk with parents about is trying to understand what their child sees in this other person. What is it that this person is giving them that um, draws them to them? So if it's a peer relationship, maybe it's status. If it's a dating relationship, maybe it's an understanding um, that they're not getting somewhere else and being able to understand what it is, um, that they're getting can help you when, if the relationship breaks up, um, help them find a way to get that in a, in a different way. Um, but a lot of times I see, particularly with, with teens, uh, if, if the parent, um, foregoes, the relationship and says, I disapprove. And it's okay to say it once, I'll say. Say it once, I disapprove and here's why. But I support you and I wanna, you know, let me get real curious and let me understand what you're getting out of it. That's sort of the best way to go. But if the parent forecloses the conversation and says, you're gonna do what I say, um, what's gonna end up happening is the child, should they need your help, may not reach out. Mm -hmm. and they're, they fear your judgment, right? So even mm -hmm. if you were totally right, um, he was a jerk <laughs> and you knew it, um, you being judging me is gonna keep me from coming and telling you. And that's not what you want across your lifespan with your kid. You want your kid to be able to talk to you no matter what happens and even when they make mistakes and so if we're in the domestic violence situation and we need to intervene because of safety, that's one matter. But having preferences um, about who they hang out with, um, that should uh, garner curiosity from you and support because you always want them to come back and seek your help and instead of being afraid of you judging them. Thank you for that, Dr. Hughes. So um, the same person who asked about, does it tend to get worse, has a follow-up question. She wants to know, what's the best way to support someone you love who is in a domestic violence situation? So um, we're back to the self and other, and we're back to valuing the sense of self. And um, so really what you're looking to do is support that what they think and feel matters in this relationship and may or may not be equal. And so helping them to develop 
their, uh, what we call in psychology, self-efficacy, that they can affect their outcome, that they can have a goal and reach it. That's what's going to help them ultimately get there. Um, support and love and I know you matter, let's focus on you is really what's gonna help them. Um, again, it's sort of the same thing with parents um, not liking relationships. You pointing out that, uh, I'm gonna use stereotypic he and she, pointing out stereotypically that he's a jerk. Um, even when they say he's a jerk, they'll always remember what you said and never remember what they said. <laughs> so, so true. Um, <laughs> so true. And so, um, you know, being right, like if I have to fess up to you that you were right all along, um, that's not going to be um, welcome. They have to come to it themselves. And um, it's sort of like, you know, you can set up the right environment for kids to walk, to read, to make choices, but they're their choices. Mm -hmm. And so you have to help them, help them get there and say, I'm here with you. But developing the sense of self is, um, is underappreciated. And maybe I should say this because in America, we, we think we have like a, a strong independent, uh, um, self first. Uh, but what I'm talking about is really an internal sense of self, not the external, how do people see me, but rather, how do I think, how do I feel, what motivates me, who am I? That's what I'm talking about. Thank you, Dr. Hughes. We have uh, two more questions again. Uh, we have, how am I supposed to know what's happening in my child's relationship? Oh, so uh, that's probably a parent of a teenager who uh, probably won't know. <laughs> um, so again, as kids age, uh, they become more peer focused than family focused, looking for external um, sources of information for decision making. Um, so when kids veer out, that's very, very normal. So you should feel like, okay, that's fine. That's not really a problem. Uh, however, um, again, being curious and asking questions is useful. A lot of times kids won't answer. They'll be like, it's fine. Things are good. Get a one word answer, right? Um, but I always tell parents, you know, kind of be a potted plant, be near, be proximal, fold the laundry where people are in public. Uh, hang out, don't talk in the car, but listen to what's happening uh, when you're driving your kids around. Um, don't weigh in, but be near. And you'll hear a lot of things. They wanna, they wanna tell you kids and all the way up through adulthood, we all want our approval of our parents. And we all wanna be able to go back and touch base and say, I know you got me, right? Um, mm -hmm. So making sure that you're, available, but waiting. I, I would agree with you 100%, you know, and again, as a, a parent to 18 and 20 year old girls, daughters, um, you know, <laughs> this is a very good question, you know, because if they don't want to tell you, they're not going to share it with you. Um, especially <laughs> as you said before, and two questions before that, if they feel judged, if they feel ridiculed, um, you know, if, if they feel as though you're you're looking down or speaking down, they will close. And unfortunately, they may end up staying in that abusive relationship longer or even indefinitely um, because of that in potential shame and embarrassment and, and a lack of, of support. Um, so thank you for sharing that. Also, if, uh, if someone is in an emotionally abusive relationship where there's a lot of yelling and, and uh, a, a lot of precursor violence as far as the words are concerned, the, the um, you know, almost like uh, defecating on, on their, their character or them as a human being, not physical, but emotional, 
what can be done to support that person if you are seeing or witnessing it? So, oh, so if you're seeing or witnessing it. So the first thing is, um, I just want to put out there that there's a, a, an overemphasis on physical violence and an underappreciation of emotional uh, aggression and interpersonal aggression. Um, words matter. Uh, we can, you can, I'm sure I, I can think of, and you can think of, um, and everyone in the audience can think of, of times when people have humiliated them or said something um, horrible to them that stuck with you um, and that lots of people move on and you're like, that hit me hard and it hurts me still. Um, so I don't want to, I don't want people to undervalue emotional, um, emotional aggression because it matters very, very much. Um, and emotional neglect too, I'll put that out there. So what can you do if you see it happening? Um, so I like to use a lot of techniques that are um, non-judgmental, but um, that we would use with things like microaggressions as well. So something like, ooh, ow, yikes, oh my gosh, you didn't just say that, did you out loud? Or something like, whoa, 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 <laughs> I think things are getting a little crazy here. So you can model um, how to, I hear you, I'm touching it, I'm saying that's not appropriate, but I'm not, I'm not in combat with you, right? I'm not trying to fight you. What I'm trying to say is, hold down, hold up. That's not um, an appropriate way to talk to, talk to people. Um, but without drawing, you know, a new fight, <laughs> now, now I'm going to put you down. So that's what you uh, want to be thinking about, is how to say it tactfully. Sometimes people um, are can be very clear, and sometimes I'm very clear. You know, that's not the way that you talk to me, or we don't say those kinds of words here, or that's not an appropriate way to interact with me. That's totally fine too. But I think what that really works in uh, in relationships where you're the adult. When you're talking peer to peer, it's really like I'm not trying to I, I, I'm not trying to do anything but to say. I don't, I don't play like that. We don't talk like that. I don't talk like that. I don't appreciate that. I messages are really good. Thank you, Dr. Hughes. And we have another question. Why do my kids act one way in front of me, yet another way when they are out with their friends? <laughs> That's the question of all parents everywhere. <laughs> this is all parents everywhere. Like I had no idea. And we're like, of course, <laughs> of course you don't. That's actually a, a developmental task to um, be able to uh, read the room, determine what the task demand is. What am I supposed to act like in the hospital, in church, in front of my parents, right? And you put on your like, this is the right way to be. Um, and then to be completely different with your, with your peers. Uh, we actually want kids to be able to do that. Um, we even teach them from when they're when they're very little, right? So think of the example where you get get the present from grandma that you don't like at all. <laughs> like, <laughs> what is the thing to do under that situation? <laughs> you smile and say thank you. That's what the yeah. task demand is. This is what you're supposed to do. Um, and so as kids age, they learn that given the setting that I'm in, this is what the setting demands uh, from me. So uh, one, that's a healthy developmental task. And two, um, it's not problematic. You want them to be able to be um, different than with, with their peers than they are with their parents. Just like exactly. you're different when you're with your peers. <laughs> yes, I, I was just going to say, exactly. I mean, we all wear so many hats in our lives. And so obviously, the, even the tone and the demeanor of which we're talking right now would be different from perhaps when I'm with my colleagues in a meeting, or if I'm, you know, talking to my mom with my daughters, my family members, friends. So, you know, I, I, I do think that that is very normal. And as you said, it, it's appropriate. You know, you, you do learn how to talk and how to 
navigate through conversations based on on who you are with and i also think that it really helps to allow you to uh, to identify more with who you are what you like and how you work with others you know in, in different settings and situations we think about emotional intelligence probably people in your audience have heard about emotional intelligence um, as being uh, the one of the key factors more than IQ to success uh, in business and in relationships and really understanding that emotional intelligence is really this relationship issue. Mm -hmm. How do I think and feel? How do you think and feel? How can we work together to accomplish a goal? How can we come together to have a business interaction or have a family interaction or whatever it is. And the more attuned you are to that, the more successful um, you'll be and the easier your <laughs> the easier your life will be because um, you'll see it coming when it's, <laughs> you'll look at and meet a person and go, ah, okay, I, I see what's going on here. And uh, here's how I'm gonna deal with that and making your own choices. And so that gives you a lot of autonomy and choices um, for how you manage your life. I agree with you. And thank you for bringing up emotional intelligence. I appreciate that because, you know, we talk about where, you know, K-12, we, we are here to work with students and educate them, right? So it's the academic intelligence we talk about, but we also need to be mindful that you're more than just that, right? You've got your social, your emotional, your psychosocial growth and intelligence that you need to consider and develop on the same level as your academics in order to be, uh, you know, have the, the life skills, the soft skills in order to be able to work through some of these situations that hopefully none of you will ever find yourselves in um, that we're discussing today. And hopefully everything that Dr. Hughes shared about having healthy relationships and healthy boundaries are what each and every person here today and listening to this uh, will have in their lifetime. Yet, if you don't, hopefully this will give you the tools, especially in this Q&A, all these questions that have come through to really help progress forward. I'm gonna add just one uh, quick thing, um, because one thing that schools uh, are more salient, is more salient to them is understanding uh, cultural sensitivity and uh, culturally relevant uh, instruction. And really it's that understanding how other people work um, that cues you to that um, rather than uh, just thinking like the world is the way we think the world is it's that curiosity about how do you think and feel and therefore how can i use that for us to have successful interactions in the classroom successful interactions um, like you said academically social emotionally and so having that balance um, the reciprocalness is really what um, allows you to get that done. Thank you, Dr. Hughes. Just want to make sure that we do not have any other questions. A lot of great questions. So thank you so much, everyone, for all the questions that are coming through. Um, the comments here that you're giving such uh, great insight. Appreciate that from the chat box. All right. So I don't see any additional questions. So at this time, I just want to thank Dr. Hughes so much for going through this presentation with us and for answering all of the questions that you had. And, you know, obviously, if you continue to have questions, we will continue to support you because remember, our goal and our mission here are to lift each other up. So thank you for that. Also want to share we had 49 loves in here. So really wonderful we had 49 loves 49 hearts we had 11 likes 17 smiles so that's great too because you know we're talking about heavy information here right so the fact that there were some times where there was a little bit of lightheartedness again that's really healthy and very mindful um so very much appreciate that as well so we just want to remind you that we do have upcoming events. So you can see in March, we have our series that will be on Be the Best You in competition. Really important to talk about this. Uh, and then, of course, in April, we are going to focus on managing your stress. Some stress is, is good, 
but unhealthy stress is is not and can be very uh, detrimental to your overall mental well-being so we will talk about that and then of course we just want to remind you again, please spread the word, let everyone know. We had a couple of people that were in here tonight that were at our first one in January. So we just want to give you a special thank you for coming back. We really appreciate you here. Um, that's wonderful, you know, the fact that you were here. And uh, so, so we are very appreciative of you. Um, also, thank you for the new people who came in this evening. And, you know, please share our mission here. So again, we thank you for joining us. We hope that we will see you in March and April for our future events as we grow, lift each other up. And just again, please sign up, sign up today. You guys signed up. So, you know, maybe have some other people sign up or please return in March when we come back together. And just as a reminder, the link is in the resource tool. And when the webinar concludes, you will see that as well, as well as additional resources that Dr. Hughes has shared with us. So anything parting that you would like to say, Dr. Hughes, before we go ahead and end the series today? It was great being with you all. And I encourage you guys to ask more and more questions. Thank you so much. We very much appreciate you being here with us and, and going through your information and all of the plethora of questions that we have. We also thank you for everyone coming in. Rich, again, this is your vision, so thank you for putting this together. Everyone, we appreciate you, and thank you for helping to make the world a kinder, more loving, and accepting place. Take care, everyone.